Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see uh, everyone uh, here this morning. We do give you all a, a very warm welcome to our Sunday morning service here at the Beacon. Good morning. Good morning. If uh, just looking out there, if this was a ship, we'd sort of be we'd sort of be tilting tilting that way a bit this morning. But uh, but great great to see uh, everybody. Uh, we al also welcome those of you who are joining us uh, via Zoom or catching up with us on on YouTube later. We do pray that God will bless all of us as we worship Him together. This morning we're going to continue our series, which we started last week looking at John's three letters, which we've called Walking in the Light. And this morning, our speaker is James, who's one of our pastors here, and he'll be taking us through 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, to chapter 2, verse 2. And uh, his title this morning is Walking in God's Light. Well, it's been quite a week, hasn't it? Uh, a week really like no other week when we've remembered the life of the Queen and where thousands of people have queued up in London for hours and hours just to file past her coffin to pay the last respects. And of course, all this is leading up to her funeral tomorrow. We've also begun to celebrate that there's a new King, King Charles III, who's been doing a whistle-stop tour of the UK as he begins his reign. We've had to learn a new song, which seem, uh, still seems a little strange. God save our gracious king, uh, national anthem. It's true, isn't it, that kings and queens come and go, and we struggle as we mourn or try to come to terms with how we are feeling, because she's the only monarch we've, uh, we've known. But this morning, I just wanted to encourage us that no matter how we're feeling right now, we are children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the King who is greater than any other, who never changes and will never fail or leave us, the King who is our shepherd, our saviour and our friend. I think the psalmist puts it best in Psalm 95. He tells us, come let us sing for joy to the Lord, let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. This is the king who we're here and we're worshipping this morning. So as we start, I'm going to pray for us and then we'll sing our first song. And then Bill Smith is going to bring us, bring us our Bible reading before James speaks to us. So let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we come together this morning to worship you, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We are reminded that you created all things and that the earth and all that is in it is in your hands. We thank you for your goodness to us and that your love for us, a love that will never let us go, a love that was displayed when you sent your son Jesus to take the punishment for our sins in his death on the cross. We pray for our country at this time as, as we mourn the death of Queen Elizabeth. We pray in particular for all the royal family who are grieving not only the loss of a queen, but a mother, grandmother and great grandmother. Be with them and strengthen them at this time. May they know your comfort and indeed may they come to know you as she did. We pray for the funeral tomorrow. Give those leading the ceremony and in particular, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, the freedom to proclaim the gospel to those present and to the millions watching on TV. And we ask that your word will touch people's hearts and cause them to turn to you. We thank you that as we meet this morning, you are here right in our midst. May we feel your presence with us as we sing, hear your word read 
and as James explains it to us. Speak into each of our lives and give us ears to hear what you're saying to us. Bless our children in Kids Church. We thank you for each of them and for the teachers and for their faithfulness and commitment to you. So Lord, this morning, we ask for your blessing upon us and we ask that all that we do is acceptable in your sight. Amen. Okay, so let's sing our first song and then Bill will bring us our Bible reading before James speaks to us. Let's just stand. This is my new super high-tech mobile phone, which is so advanced, it just looks like a piece of paper. <laughs> the readings from the Epistle of John, chapter 1, verses 5 to 10, and chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, 
we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be uh, back with you this morning. Um, thanks to, to Glyn and the musicians and for Bill for leading our time uh, together so far this morning. Uh, our prayer would be, really, if you're with us for the, the first time or, or are new to us or have been worshipping with us for years, you'll be blessed as we meet together and as we look at God's word. We're into our, our second week, as Glyn said in his introduction, of looking at John's letters. And our plan is always when we do a series like this that you should be able to drop into it whatever stage we're at and you'll be able to find your bearings you'll be able to get an understanding of what's going on it's not one of those complex tv shows where you're joining like in series seven and if you haven't watched the preceding 150 episodes you won't have a clue what's going on it should be that you're able to to access what we're talking about and it will mean something to you but if i can encourage you do go back and listen to what anthony said last week it sets the scene, it sets the context of this letter. It's really going to help with your understanding as we go through it all. And having listened to it myself on YouTube, you will be blessed and encouraged. You will find stuff in there that's going to help you as we move forward. Please do uh, remember Anthony and Emma in your prayers today. They're dropping Sam off at uni, so they're traveling all the way down to London, settling him in, doing all that unpacking, and then traveling back, which is always an emotional journey. I remember my mum telling me how emotional it was having left um, when I just probably didn't really look back as a uni student and I'm just carrying on. But it's a really emotional time. Please pray for them as they travel home later on today. So we're thinking, um, about walking in God's light, these first few, these verses at the end of John chapter one. And there's a really significant reason why we picked one John to look at. Later next month, we're gonna be celebrating the 10th anniversary of the church. And maybe if you were with us at the start as we met at what was Glynn Baptist Church, you will remember that when we first met, we initially studied the one another passages that took us up to Christmas. And then after Christmas, we said we wanted to study a book together. We wanted to systematically go through a book and study it and see how it built and see what God's word was saying to us as a church. And that book was 1 John. We've had it had some really important things to say to us about what it means to be walking in fellowship, to be living in God's light and in God's love. And as we come to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the church, the church has changed. Some of us were there 10 years ago. Many of us maybe have only joined in, in the years that have passed or very recently. But the reality is that key message of seeking to live in God's light, seeking to love each other and seeking to live in fellowship, well, they're as important today as they were 10 years ago. We still need that reminder of how God wants us to live as his people and as his church. I say, if you listened to, to Anthony's introduction last week, you might also have noticed on the newsletter this week, there was a, a little link to a, a short 10 minute video he did with another overview of 1 John. There was so much to say last week in a, a 20 minute sermon, because we also broke bread, that he didn't feel he managed to say everything he wanted to say. So he did uh, another video. And it just broke down how 1 John fits together. So last week we looked at the prologue in the first four verses, and you can then see there's two distinct parts to the letter. Part one, which we're starting today, which runs from 1 John 1, my word, there's too many ones at times, 1 John 1 verse 5 through to chapter 3 verse 10, and then the second part picks up after that from verse 11 in chapter 3 and runs through to chapter 12 of verse 5. 
both those distinct sections start with the phrase, this is the message. And in part one, we think about the idea that God is light and what it means for us to walk in that light and live accordingly. And then the second part, again, the simple message is God is love and that we should walk in love before he finishes off with the last few verses. And that's where we're going to be this morning. And for the next few weeks, the next month or so, we are going to be thinking about the fact that God is light. It says something about God's character and who he is. So let's look at these verses together. And just in verse five, as we start this, this is the message. I want you to see the big contrast. It's light and dark. It's one of the biggest contrasts we're going to see, maybe by our life and death. It's a big contrast. And John shares this in verse five. He says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. We sometimes think about light and dark as sort of being metaphors. Um, the idea that light's going to shine into the darkness and overcome it, and that we think of Jesus being the light of the world and how those things fit together. And we see different metaphors in scripture. The idea that Jesus is the door or the gate. We're not going to be up in heaven and Jesus is going to look like a door or a gate, but it's a metaphor. This isn't a metaphor. John isn't saying God is like light to help you understand it. He is saying God is light. He's defining his character. He's saying something about his attributes, that God is light, that he is radiant, that he is spotless, bright. All the things that we associate with being in the light and there is no darkness in him at all. He is totally separate from the idea of anything that is dark. So we have light as this really powerful image, almost of sort of holiness and brilliance on one side, and this idea of darkness on the other side, because darkness is also a really powerful image. We're not talking about sort of dusk when you forget to put the bins out and you have to sort of scrabble around in the dark and you're trying to find them and not trip over anything that your kids have left on the driveway. No, this is real darkness. Pitch black, you can't see anything darkness. There's no dimmer switch here or gradients between light and dark. We're meant to see them as a split, separate, not linked. In the light, you can see. You can see what's happening and God is there. And in the darkness, there is no sight and no presence of God. And John's going to take this distinct pictures and draw application from them. We need to be really clear this morning, right from the start. If you're a Christian, you should be walking in the light. That's where you should be, in the light, because that's where God is. So we've got our big contrast in verse 5. And we then move on in verses six and 6 to 10 to see some big ifs. Some big if statements, conditional statements that John is going to make about our walk and what should be happening. They alternate between negative and positive. There's three negatives, unfortunately, but there are two positives. And they're the implications of this light and dark theme. So let's take them together. Again, we're meant to see the contrast of them. There's buts in there that highlight it so we can see what is going on. But these first three, the negative ones that center around the idea of us being truthful and having integrity, it says this, verse six, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Verse eight, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Do you see those key themes? There's those ideas of lying, of truth, of deception. It wants to paint this picture of a lack of integrity of the person who says they walk in the light, but is actually walking in darkness. It's talking about how we live. And if we're claiming to have relationship with God and follow him and live for him, yet aren't living like it, 
Well, that's really problematic. It's not something we should be doing. See, problem one, if I want to say that I've got no sin in my life, is that I'm actually fooling myself. I'm lying to myself. I'm denying the fact that it's there. I'm deceiving what's going on. I'm looking past the things that are happening and I'm not living right. And maybe we're kind of all familiar with those sorts of things in our day-to-day lives. There'll be things we know we should address, but we just aren't at times. So that's, that's the first problem. But there's also a second problem, which is also really big. You see, the wording of verse 10 says when we've sinned, we make God out to be a liar. It's not just about the impact it has on me and the fact that I'm deceiving myself. I make God a liar by denying my sin. That's huge. Just think about what John is saying for a sec. I make God out to be a liar. How's he saying that? Well, when you disagree with someone, which I'm sure we've all done at some point, when you disagree with them and you hold a different view, actually, what the view you're holding is that I'm right and that you're wrong. Basically, black and white, that's kind of how it goes. You think you're right and that they must be wrong. So if I'm saying I walk in the light, I live the right way and I do things right, but I'm doing things wrong, but I'm not saying they're wrong, the implication that the person who says they're wrong isn't right. Does that make sense? There's a lot of wrongs and rights in there. But I'm pointing at the person who defines that sin as being wrong and saying, well, it's, it's not because I'm not really committing it. And the person who says that that sin is wrong is God. So as I'm carrying on in my life and just doing those wrong things, and people look at me and think, well, that must be okay, because that person who claims to be a Christian and walking in the light is doing them, the implication is that God who says it's a sin is wrong because otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. And that's huge. That's massive to say that the things that God says are wrong aren't really wrong, because I'm saying he's not being truthful. That's that's massive. That's the implication of me denying my sin in my life. So we've got these two big pictures. One is that I'm lying to myself, and the other is that I'm saying that God is a liar in his definitions of what sin is. But there are positive implications interspersed between those negative ones to encourage us as we continue to walk. So in verse 7 it says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin. And then in verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. While there's implications for being in the dark, there's also implications of being in the light because that's where God is. That's where truth is. That's where purification is. And John's encouraging and saying, if you walk in the light with God, that's a good thing. If you're living right and seeking to walk with him, that's good. We maybe expect verse 7 to say to us, we have fellowship with him, but it doesn't. It says fellowship with each other, because there's a communal element. When we are all walking the right way, that's where we properly experience fellowship. Walking together in the light, sin-free. That's where true fellowship is found. And we know that if we confess our sins, because we will sin, God will forgive us if we own it, if we acknowledge it and say that it's there. And that's the attitude John is aiming for. That's what he's wanting to prompt in our behaviour, that we acknowledge our own sin, that we say it's there, that we're aware of it, that because we're in the light that we can see it. Because if we are walking closely with him and can see in the light, we should be able to see our sin. That's what should be happening. You know what? It takes a lot of self-reflection and real honesty to acknowledge when there is sin in your life. A few weeks ago, you'll remember that we, we held a baptism. And while I don't want to do too much attention to it, if you were here and you listened to Luke speak, 
there was real honesty as he acknowledged the battles that he's been through. It's really brave to acknowledge those in front of the whole church. And we need to acknowledge that, that it is brave and it takes courage. It's not easy. We aren't called to stand up here and say what all of our sin is. But sometimes it will take just as much courage to acknowledge to ourselves what some of those sins are that we are choosing to ignore. You don't have to stand up here, but it might be good to acknowledge them yourself or maybe even talk to one or two people if you are struggling and you know you are in a pattern of sin so they can support you, so they can pray for you, so that you can be held accountable to them. Because there's no scale to sin. It's all an issue. We never have a list in the Bible of like, here's the really, really bad sins over here. If you're doing these, you're terrible. And if you're doing these little gray ones over here, well, that's, that's okay. That's sort of all right. And there's some in the middle, which we'll try not to do. It's not how the Bible speaks of sin. All sin is bad. Whether it's to do with sexual immorality, or lust, or pornography, or something that we can see and really easily identify, it's no worse than a, another sin. The chances are we will all have different sins in our lives that are just as prevalent. You might really like a gossip. No one really knows that you're having a gossip because you distract it and dress it up as, as other things. But you know if you've got some information, you can't wait to tell anyone about it. And you might, you might pretend that, oh, I'm just telling you so we can pray about it. Because I feel you really need to know about this and we can, you can talk about it. It's good that you would know. But some people really like a, a gossip. Some people might have anger issues. It's not there all the time. But actually, when it does dwell up, they know it's there. And it appears and it manifests. And they're like, yeah, I do get angry, but I'm not going to do anything about it because I'm just that kind of person. It might be that you're really sarcastic and you use it as a way of putting other people down. I really struggle with sarcasm. I'm terrible for sarcasm. Someone walked in this morning, Henry walked in, and looked at me and said, oh, have you still got that band on? And I looked at it and said, no, I took this off yesterday. Because my nature is to be sarcastic. Now, it's, hopefully Henry realised I was joking, because I'm still wearing the band. It's quite obvious it's not there. It's there. But you can use sarcasm to put people down to belittle people, to make them feel inferior. It might be that we struggle with materialism and the love of money, or just pride that people will look at us in a certain way and think that we're a certain type of person. These are really big issues, and we need to seek to address them in our lives. There's no less problematic sins they all need to be dealt with. Now, the reality is when we get to this point, the end of verse 10, obviously they wouldn't have had chapter breaks or anything like that. If you read 1 John, don't stop at chapter 10 or verse 10 at the end of chapter 1. Two, keep reading. That's why it's a section in your Bible. But the reality is if you were to get to this little section, certainly if you've got a phone where it doesn't automatically give you the next few verses, you might really struggle. Because the reality is we'd see ourselves as terrible Christians. Terrible Christians, wanting to be good but ending up sinning. What is John saying about me that I want to be a Christian, I want to walk in the light, but I am continually walking in the darkness? Well, John goes on to remind us that even though there's lots of big ifs, lots of times where we struggle in the dark, we have a big saviour in verses 1 and 2. John's been really, really clear so far, laid it out. He's been firm with the church of what it means to be walking the right way. But he now reminds them, you have a really big hope in Jesus. It might be that you want to walk in the light, but you know that you're falling, you're struggling with sin, that you'll sometimes stray, that you'll battle against it. But you know what? You can have a hope because of Jesus. John still has a big hope for how you're going to behave, which is how he starts at the beginning of verse 2, sorry, chapter 1, verse 2, where he says this, My dear children, I write this so that you will not sin. 
He has a clear intention and a desire for us that we should be living sin free. We should be walking in the light, not sinning, walking rightly before other people. But he knows from his own life that won't happen all the time. And it leads him into the next verse where he says this. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. John wants us to see that balance. He wants us to see that we must know we're in sin and we're living and that sin present in our lives. But he wants us to know we have an advocate, one who is at the Father's hand pleading for us, one who has dealt with our sin. So that we know it's not based on me. It's not based on my actions and whether I spend more than 50% of the time in the light or not. Or whatever mark we might want to use. He says, no. Know that Jesus has paid it all. That his love will not be exhausted. Sometimes it's really, really helpful and really encouraging to know certain things. And certain things really stick with you. When I went to the, the Northwest Partnerships Conference last year, a guy called Ray Ortland was speaking. And he was talking about how when, when we sin, God never gets fed up of welcoming us back. Like when you're a parent and your children do that thing you're asking them not to do for like the 50th time in a minute. And you feel yourself going like, will you please just stop doing that? Like, just, just listen to me. And, and they're not. And you can feel yourself getting wound up. When we come back to God, he's not doing that. He's not there stressing his hands and wishing we'd have listened as we come back. He's that father you see at the end of the prodigal son story who embraces his son and tells him he loves him. We can never exhaust God's love. He always wants to welcome us back. So we have that and we see that picture and John wants us to know that hope that we are not going to exhaust Christ's love towards us. But he also wants us to have the right mindset so we don't just carry on sinning. I don't know what version of the Bible that you're, you're reading from, but the start of chapter 2, verse 2, in the NIV reads like this. It says, he is the atoning sacrifice. In the ESV, it says uh, the sacrifice that atones. And these are pictures of what's going on. Atonement is, is absolutely right as to what's happening when Jesus dies on the cross. He's paying the price for our sins, atoning for us, so that we can have a right, right relationship with the Father. Now, if you go and you read a slightly older traditional version, maybe the ESV or the New King James, um, or even the King James, not just the New King James, it will have the word propitiation in that sentence. Now, it's really important, and, and you'll know that I'm not exactly a Greek scholar, so I'm not standing up here and saying the people who, who did the NIV got it wrong. I, I, I don't want to say that. But atoning sacrifice softens ever so slightly what is happening in this verse. Because propitiation, and the word propitiation, refers to the fact that God's wrath is turned away during sin. When Christ pays the price for our sins, Jesus takes God's wrath and anger and judgment that that sin deserves and bears it on himself. Now, atoning sacrifice doesn't convey that. It just talks about the idea that Jesus is atoning for us. But propitiation helps us to see that Christ suffered for those sins. And what John is wanting to say to us is, yes, we have an advocate. Yes, we have one who pays the price for our sins, he was the propitiation for those sins, though. When you sin, that contributed to Christ's suffering and bearing the price for your sin. That wrath had to be spent that God feels towards that sin, and it is spent on Jesus. And he bore that punishment. Because what John is wanting you to see is, yes, when I come to him, he will welcome me as a father, and I can never exhaust that. But at the same time, no, when you do sin, 
Jesus had to bear the penalty and the wrath and the anger and the justice of that sin on the cross. Because John wants us to come away from this having the right view of sin. Knowing that it will never stand in our way of the Father if we trust him and know him, but that we should be seeking to live the right way. Seeking to live that we don't sin. So we've got our our big contrast, our big ifs, and our big saviors, our big saviour. And I think that this leads on to some really big questions as we work out our implications. The first one for me was, do you want to walk in the light? Do you really want to walk in the light? And if you've been a Christian for years, our immediate response will be, well, yes, of course I want to walk in the light. Of course, that's where I want to walk. I want to walk with Jesus. But do you really want it? Is that where you really want to be with all the good things that Jesus offers? Or is it actually that you feel you should be obliged to walk in the light because that's what a good Christian does? When actually, maybe you'd rather walk in darkness and you'd rather be given over to those other things rather than living for Jesus. Because the reality for all of us, even if we've been a Christian for years, is that we can still want and desire sin. We can still want those things, to to go into the darkness and live there for a few moments, to want to stray there. Even though we maybe know it's wrong, but we won't want to deny ourselves. And we will sometimes give in. In some respects, the the real implication of this question is, do you find your joy in Jesus and the things of him? So that you want to be in the light and you find all your satisfaction and everything you need in him so that you're not looking elsewhere. Because if not, if the things that you really enjoy doing and the fun things are over there in the darkness, you're going to have a lifelong battle of trying to ignore them. A constant denial, a constant fight, which might be hard to admit and acknowledge, but it's gonna wanna be constantly pulling you over there. And if we don't acknowledge it and deal with it like John is saying, we're always gonna struggle. There's a great uh, line in, uh, in a song that one of my friends always used to joke was his brother's favorite line. So it's in the song, When Peace Like a River, which is the one that goes, it is well with the, the split parts. But the start of the third verse says, my sin, oh, the bliss of the glorious thought. It's a really honest lyric because it's saying sin isn't just something we do because we want to be rebellious and kick against the rules. Actually, we find bliss and enjoyment and satisfaction in sin. And these are big problems. Because in those moments where life's hard, if we find little enjoyment in Jesus, we'll turn to the dark. We'll have that live for the weekend mentality where we'll just stray over to the dark for a little bit. And we'll live over here. Even though we not know that we shouldn't be over there, we'll sort of live over there for a little bit, give in to sin. Even to the point maybe in some instances where we know we're going to do it and we almost pre-apologize to God for the fact we're going to. I know, I know I'm going to do this. It's not even like I need to say I'm sorry for having done it. I'm going to say sorry for doing it because I know it's going to happen. We should be looking to Jesus and wanting to walk in the light so we find all our happiness in him so that the dark isn't tempting us to go there because we find completion in him. And this leads on to this big picture, not just of wanting to walk in the light, but having the right attitude to sin. Seeking to own our sin, acknowledge it in our own hearts and lives. But importantly, like John says, seeking to cut it out. Seeking to identify what it is that's going on and seeking to say, I don't want to do those things anymore. But the reality is, we're a Big church. I don't know what sins you are personally fighting against and battling with. But whatever they are, we need to identify them. 
It might be that you're in a wrong relationship with someone, that it's sexual immorality and you need to deal with it. We don't often stand at the front of church and say certain things that are really wrong are really wrong. You know, I hope you know murder's wrong. I kind of think sort of someone would be arrested if they'd committed a murder, and I'm not sort of trying to joke about that to lessen it, but, but we all know that, that murder is, is wrong. We don't very often say murder is wrong, you shouldn't be murdering anyone, but, but I hope we all know that. Adultery is wrong. Lying is wrong. Stealing is wrong. And if we're doing any of those things, you might not want to label it as such, but if you are doing any of those things, you need to hear what John is saying and stop. Because that's how we should be living. It might be that you're jealous of people or that you envy someone. It's stop doing it. Acknowledge it's there. It might be that you really dislike someone to the point almost where Jesus would say you hate them and you you want to murder them in your heart and you know that the relationship isn't right but you keep putting off dealing with it trying to avoid that person it might be someone in church where you just i'll try not to interact with them we'll, we'll sort of go in different directions in church so we never have to cross paths it's not okay to do that to continually have that heart of darkness and be walking in dark, even though it might not be prevalent in your life all the time, there will be moments when it rears its head. And John isn't saying just ignore it and pretend it's not there till it goes away and stops being an issue. He's saying deal with it, acknowledge it, own it, claim it, know Christ died for it and stop doing it. The chances are we have all got some form of habitual sin. Something that's going on regularly in our life. Maybe something that we really regret or something that we've got no real intention of dealing with. John is clear how we should want to live. We should want to deal with it. We should want to respond so that we are not sinning. Because I really want to encourage you, while this verse and these chapters speak really powerfully about how we should be viewing our sin, God's plan is that we walk in the light together. That we walk together, experiencing true fellowship, knowing that we are forgiven and that God is light and that we rejoice in the fact that Christ is our saviour. He doesn't want us to be a church that sins. He wants us to be a church that lives the right way. And this is why he gives us this beautiful picture of saying, if you sin, sort it out. Address it, be honest with yourself, be honest with the Lord. But ultimately, know that you are forgiven because of Jesus. Know that he paid the price for your sin. And because of that, you can come and walk in the light and know him and have true fellowship with him and the other believers around you. We're going to pray, um, pray in just a moment. Um, I just want to give us a, a moment to reflect because realistically, the, the challenge maybe for all of us, unless you're, you're perfect, in which case you've possibly hidden it from me for years, this should be something that's maybe speaking to all of our hearts. I hope there is. I hope there's, there's something, not necessarily something that I've said, but you've, we've read through it. There's something you thought, I need to sort this out in my life. Is there an error I need to deal with? I just want to give us a moment to give those over to God before we pray and then we sing again. So let's just take a, a moment to reflect. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you, Lord, and we, we see this picture that, that we've got of light and dark, Lord, and, and you give us this clear picture of what it, what it means to, to walk with you. And we thank you that because of Jesus, because of his death, we are able to, and we're able to have relationship with you, Lord. I just pray for those things that, that maybe we all know are, are going on in our lives, where, where things aren't right, where there's, there's a, 
a pattern of sin, something that we're doing. There may be at times we don't want to take responsibility for or own up or even acknowledge, but, but we know it's there and try and pretend it's not. Lord, if those things aren't right, if they're not the way that you've called us to live, I pray that you'd challenge us on them, that you would speak to our hearts, that we would see them for what they are and that we would respond. Lord, I thank you that the picture that you have for us as a church is that we wouldn't sin, that we would seek to live together in your light and fellowship to one another, but that we can rejoice knowing that because of Jesus, we can come and that you welcome us back. We thank you for that picture. We thank you for him. We thank you for his death. We thank you that it's not based on ourselves, but it is solely based on what he has done. Help us to live in response. Help us to be the people that you would have us be for your glory and honour, we pray, Heavenly Father. Amen.
Welcome kids, lovely to see you all, are you all okay? Good, lovely. It's nice that you come through to main church so subdued from kids church. Um, now, we're going to do um, something we've done uh, a little bit, I can't remember the last time we did one, I can't remember if you did one during the summer, um, but we do what we call a this time tomorrow interview where we speak to someone and find out what they'd usually be doing i say usually doing because let's be honest at quarter to 11 tomorrow we're probably all going to be doing something very similar um so interviewing someone about what they're doing wouldn't be that exciting but we're gonna ask what would you usually be doing at this time on a monday so i'm gonna ask simon um to come out and join me um and we're gonna find out a little bit about simon and as i stand here i kind of feel this is probably what it's like for you guys when we get you to come and stand out at the front of church and you have to stand next to one of the adults and so we ask questions and you look up at us like this as we're talking and sort of listening um so it, it you know it's interesting to experience things from your side um but we're going to ask Simon some questions get to get to know him um, and find out a little bit more about him so Simon do uh, just just take a moment or two to just introduce yourself say who you are a little bit about your background and where you're from all right, thank you. Uh, hi, good morning, my name's Simon. Um, as you know, Emily, uh, my wife and I have been here now for about a year and a half. Uh, I'm a postman. She currently works for O2. She does sales roles predominantly. And um, yeah, I like to do stuff with the kids ministries here. Uh, in fact, I've just come from class two, which is why they're so subdued. And um, uh, I also do uh, another youth group called Young Life. Um, but other than that, there's not really much more to tell. Okay, lovely, thanks Simon. So. We've got someone we can hang on to, a postman. Now, this is better when someone stands up and says, I'm a data processing analyst. And you're like, I don't have a clue what that means. But there's a danger we're gonna have an idea of what we think Simon does. And he might be able to explain a little bit more. So Simon, do you wanna tell us what you typically be doing this time tomorrow on a Monday morning? Of course, we'll have been hoping it's not your usual day off. <laughs> Uh, that's right, my day off actually does rotate through the week, so um, I get one Saturday off in six. Uh, this week my day off is Saturday, so that's worked out quite nicely. Otherwise, on a Monday and a Tuesday and a Saturday, my days are fairly light, so hopefully this time in the morning I should have maybe another hour and a half to two hours left of work to do. Uh, Wednesday through Friday, I'll probably just be about an hour into my walk duty. I start at about quarter to eight, which is part-time hours. I work quarter to eight till uh, one o'clock. Uh, or two o'clock, depending on the day, and um, I spend about an hour and a half to two and a half hours prepping my duty in the morning. Uh, it's longer in the winter during Christmas, as you would expect, and then I spend between three and five hours uh, walking, walking the streets, delivering parcels and letters. Um, first thing I'd say is I work for Royal Mail, and um, I won't slay any of you who call me, um, who say I work for the post office, that's fine, but it is Royal Mail. Um, they are a different, different branch now. And otherwise, yeah, 
is pretty much what you did today. Okie doke. I'm almost, we should have a competition. I think we like, need like a league chart of who does the most steps in their job. Um, in, like, I think Kath usually wins, to be honest, because she, yeah. she never seems to sit down. But how many steps do you usually do as a, a postman a day? How far do you think you walk? Truthfully, I, I, truthfully, I don't know. Um, one thing I did find out is that step trackers count, literally count your steps as opposed to averaging it out. So there's a woman in my office about this tall, and she does probably about 5,000 more steps than I do but we definitely travel the same distance. So um, it's a little different. Um, I would say I do somewhere between 10 and 15,000 a day, depending on, uh, depending on the walk. I'm on a different walk every day. The way you're sort of holding your hand, I'm like, that's average height. <laughs> that, was, that was my height that you, <laughs> you were holding your hand at. So um, what are sort of some of the the challenges you you might face in an, in an average day, um, besides you know angry people throwing letters at you, um, what what are some of the things or dogs even classically for a postman? What what are some of the challenges you face in your work environment? So yeah, dogs dogs are one of them. Um, I think one postman a week is attacked by a dog on average, um, and that can be quite horrific. We do have a dog awareness week once a, once a year. Um, otherwise, just general workload. Um, there are 24 or 26 people in my my section in the office and if say five or six of them are off then it just means that a lot of posts isn't going to get delivered that day um, unless people do it on overtime otherwise it just rolls on um, as I expect many of you will remember the drops in in um, efficiency of raw mail during the the COVID years um, and it's it, yeah it's pretty much like that if there isn't somebody around to do the work it, it doesn't get done so it can just be a bit more manic for the rest of us um, and other than that, yeah, that's that's the general challenge. Um, other than just, you know, sometimes you really don't you really don't feel like it, um, and you can clearly see your own productivity because you've still got the letters and the parcels. It's, um, you know, sometimes you're working on a document, you're like, yeah, I'm going to bang that out in an hour, and other times it takes three hours. Whereas with me, it may take another hour just because really don't feel like it. Um, but I do do it. Do, just. <laughs> Never just like hide him in a skip and just like run on. <laughs> Not that I'll admit in public, no. <laughs> yeah, we might need to cut that bit from the video, but it's okay. It's all right. Um, is it quite a solitary job? I think like sort of the, maybe the picture we'd have is is there someone on their own and you spend spend a lot of a lot of time. Is is it hard to get alongside your colleagues or is it is it something that's easy? I'm just trying to think of maybe what we project and what we think we see with a postman as opposed to maybe what the reality is. Do you get a lot of time to chat with people you work with? So I'm in the fortunate position that at my office, we have to travel about 15 minutes to get to where we deliver because they moved our office into a warehouse with a couple of other offices. Whereas you'll see, so I'm partnered with somebody every day and my partner at the moment lost his license. So he has to work with me. Um, it's a very Pauline sort of shackled to him sort of thing. Um, but there are postmen who will, uh, post people I should say, who work by themselves, those with trolleys, those with golf carts. Um, you will typically be by yourself for 30, 45 minutes at a time. You come back to the van, drive off somewhere, deliver some parcels, pick up another bag. So I will talk to my partner, Ryan, somewhere between sort of like 30 and 60 minutes a day, depend, you know, travel times and such. So it's not just on, on your own. I mean, I do have questions about what a license is, but I'm not going to... A let driving you. license. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, you have to have a license to deliver the post? <laughs> Just not a criminal record. Yeah. Good, I'm glad we, we sorted that out. So what are, what are some of the, the biggest blessings? What could we be, be praying for you? And what could we be praying for you in, in your role as, as a postman? So the biggest blessings are that I'm able to, to see a lot of people. Um, people generally, when they see the uniform, assume that you're friendly um, and easy to talk to, um, more for them, but it does give you the opportunity to witness to people. Um, I've only ever had one complaint about um, witnessing to, to people, and that wasn't even in work, that was after work. Um, and it may not have even been about me, they just said a Christian who was in a post uniform in Manchester, and Manchester has a lot of postmen. Um, but otherwise, predominantly, it's my colleagues. So people around the office know that I'm a Christian. Um, I've spoken to Ryan, my partner, numerous times, I've spoken to previous partners. Um, I don't have the opportunity to invite them to things over here because um, due to when I moved into the Northwest, I transferred over to Manchester, which actually was a point of praise. Um, when Emily and I got married up until the last week of marriage, or up until the week before we got married. Um, 
I, I didn't know where I was going to be. Um, we knew that she was going to be working in Warrington, but I didn't know where I was going to be. So we saw God's providence um, and hand in that. So that's a point of praise. God has always been faithful to me in this job. Um, whenever I prayed for opportunities, he's given them to me. Um, at the moment, as you may know, um, the Communication Workers Union is striking. Um, for the previous four dates, I haven't striked because those, as I understand it, have been predominantly about pay, and I'm quite content with what I get paid. Um, and people have known that in the office. And for the following two strikes, which is the 30th of September and the 1st of October, which is Friday, Saturday. So if you don't get anything on the 29th, you're not going to get anything until the 2nd. Um, those are about times and conditions, which involves Sunday working. And I've said I will strike because I don't want to work on a Sunday. So people can see where I've stuck my stick in the mud. And I've appreciated people's prayers for me in that. And the only backlash I've had, if you call it a backlash, is one person stopped talking to me out of 70 colleagues. So. If you are to pray for me, pray that I would continue to look for opportunities. It's easy not to. It's easy just to go in, do the work and go home. Um, it's easy to make excuses. It's easy not to talk to Ryan. It's easy not to talk to the people around me. Um, pray that I would because people know I'm a Christian. They don't have a problem with I'm a Christian, that I'm a Christian. And they do have questions. See? No, no, thank, you. thank you. So I think it's really important to, to acknowledge as we talk about different people in different roles. It is it is a different type of evangelism when you work away from home. You know, when, you're, when you're in your community and you work alongside someone, you can invite them to the things that you're doing in your local community. It's really different when you travel to work and the person you might work alongside might travel into work from the opposite direction. So realistically, you might be an hour and a half apart in terms of where you live. And you're trying to encourage them and trying to say stuff about what your church does and they might never have heard of that place or at least unlikely to ever come to it so it is a different type of evangelism do pray for people who are in that situation teachers you know mark works in manchester and i'm sure we'll be working alongside people who who live far away and there will be others who have this kind of impact where people aren't in their local community so it's a different a different thing now i do want us to pray for those things in a moment but you said you're also involved in yl so can you just tell us a little bit about what YL, what YL is and when it happens and what YL stands for in case people don't know? Sure. Uh, and I'll take the opportunity to slow down my speech as well. I realise I've been rattling it off. So I, I do that, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So Young Life, um, otherwise known as YL, um, as I understand it, is a national organisation, but I first came across it when I moved up to the Northwest. It's predominantly focused at teens and young adults. Um, the Young Life that I'm a committee member for, which is essentially, I help run it, um, that's focused at for 18s to 30 year olds. So if you're 18 to 30, um, this group is for you. And it's aimed at discipleship and evangelism. And we will meet on a Saturday evening um, over in Wigan, just off Junction 26, if anybody knows where Gyra Chapel is, um, which is now known as Pemberton Free Grace Church. We meet there 7.30 till 9.30, and we will have this, this uh, coming year, as it looks to be, we're working through a book called On the Road to Emmaus, which came out of last term's teaching where we had a book which was 10 questions every Christian hopes they're never asked. And our group is mixed between Christian and non-Christian. And especially the non-Christian said, when you talk about God in the Old Testament, he seems angry and fiery and evil. And they were very blunt with us about what they thought of God. And so we wanted to be able to, like Jesus did on the road to Emmaus, show them through the scripture, the breadth of scripture, how God is the same, how he is a loving God, how he is a merciful God, and put into context the actions of God in the past, which I remember when I was a recent Christian, I wasn't raised in a Christian home, did seem hard to take in had to put it mildly so for the coming year we'll be looking at how god is the same god yesterday and today and forever and the evangelism of a sunday night is talking with our non-christians who come to the group and discipling those who are christians so they're able to take those answers out in conversations to their peers um yl is also a sister organization to united beach missions so we encourage participation with united beach missions um, we also have what's called an Easter speak out um, where we will go out street preaching over Easter weekend in Southport and occasionally Liverpool and they'll be not from our YL but through other YL branches across the Northwest opportunities to go out street preaching 
and we will have a talk for half an hour, um, an hour, depending on how I'm doing it, um, and then time to time to socialise, time to chat, um, some board games. It's a mix, It's about to be a mixed group. We're having some more people come in, and um, if anybody remembers a, a young man called John Straddling who came here briefly, he's also a committee member on that with me, um, and some other fellows as well. We not only talk ourselves, we have some visiting speakers. Um, we have a visiting speaker on the 1st from Liverpool YL, and we have our own Anthony Billington coming on the 8th of October. Um, and otherwise, we run every Saturday during term time, essentially. So we take a break at half term and for the Christmas summer holidays. <coughs> Lovely. So if you are over, over 18. If you um, are 18 and over. Over 18 and over, but no older than 30, and would like to get involved in YL, do come and speak to Simon. Uh, I, growing up down south, there wasn't a YL, it didn't seem to exist near where you were. So, but the number of good things I've heard about YL, I can only encourage you, if you are in that bracket, think about going along. You know, if you're, you're worried about maybe going along the first time, speak to Simon, he'll be able, to, be able to look out for you and encourage you. But it's a really good thing to go, get involved in, and, and meet other Christians in the area, I think is another one, to, to get alongside people uh, and to know other Christians in this, uh, the, the area of Wigan, who, uh, who are also sort of going through the same challenges you, you are, to speak about and pray with them uh, and think about your evangelism together. Let's pray for Simon, and then I'm going to hand over to Glyn to come and can share the notices, because I'm aware Simon and I can both go on and talk. <laughs> Heavenly Father, um, I just lift Simon up to you, Lord. We thank you for, for the opportunities he, he has, Lord. We thank you for the answers to, to prayer. Um, that, that he's seen, Lord, where you've guided, where you've led, where you've, you've brought him to a, a certain position, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunities he, he has, Lord. We, we just give over to you his, his day to day work environment. We pray for, for Ryan, who he works alongside, Lord, and, and other people he will, will interact with. We pray you give him the, the, the right words. He, he seeks to, to speak in the right way about you, um, Lord, to, to encourage them to, to speak uh, positively into their situations, to, to maybe offer advice or, or just talk about what it means to, to be a believer in those situations. I just pray for him and for his evangelism um, in those contexts, Lord. We pray for, for him and Emily, Lord. We thank you for the encouragement and, and blessing they've been to the church so far, Lord, and pray that you would continue to, to use them. And we do just lift up the, the involvement with YR that they have, uh, particularly for Simon, Lord, as he helps lead and, um, and plan for that group, Lord. We just give it over to you. We pray for those um, people who maybe don't have faith at the moment who are part of that group, Lord, speak to their hearts, uh, challenge them in the things of you. Um, Lord, but we just pray that that group would be a blessing and encouragement as they seek to serve you uh, and seek to lead, lead others to know more about you, Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Glenn, over to you for the long list of this week's notices. <laughs> yeah, if you've seen the, uh, the church email, you know that there's, there's plenty on it. So, uh, so uh, buckle in and I'll be as quick as I can. Uh, tonight at seven o'clock, uh, we'll be meeting here at church and we will be breaking bread together. Uh, as part of the meeting, we're going to be reading through the whole of, uh, of 1 John and praying from that, um, very much as the first hearers would have done. Uh, so if you come in and would like to take part in reading uh, a part of, of 1 John, uh, please speak to James. We'll also, at the end of uh, our time tonight, be taking part in the National Minute Silence. Um, uh, that's at uh, 8 o'clock uh, in... Uh, in memory of the Queen. Uh, so it'd be great to see you here if you're free tonight. All our usual things are on this week, including the house groups and kids clubs. Uh, and Ignite will also be restarting this coming Friday for school years 9 to 13. And they'll be meeting here between 7.30 and 9.30. For further information, please speak to Bethan. A few dates for your diary. Uh, on Sunday, the 2nd of October, our morning service will include the dedication of four of our little ones, Lola Farramond, Ella Pennington, Imogen Winstonley, and Elsie Chippendale. This is going to be a wonderful occasion and will be followed by a bring and share lunch across the road at the community club to which everyone's invited. So please, uh, as you heard those words, bring and share, or we used to call them faith lunches. Um, we need you to, to bring and share food. So please be planning what you're going uh, to bring for us all to, uh, to consume. The following Sunday, the 9th of October, will be our Harvest Festival. And this year we'll be supporting our local people in need by donating to the Ashton Food Bank. 
So you can bring items to church on the day, or you can make a financial gift, which will enable them to purchase uh, uh, specific items later in the year. On Thursday, the 13th of October, we'll be holding a church members meeting here in the church at 745 for those people, obviously, who are members of the church. So please make sure that you put that in the diary and we'd love as many people as possible to, uh, to be here. And, and finally, there's a special free event at 10 of those in Leyland uh, this coming Thursday called Making Sense of Life. For further details, please look at the notices email as there's a link on there that you need to register to get yourself a ticket. I'm sure Bethan will be able to fill us in with, uh, with any further details on that. Well, that's enough for this week, I think. There is more on there, so please uh, look at the notice sheet. We've got one more song, and then I'll come, I'll come back and close in prayer. Let's stand. Thank you. 
Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are light and there is no darkness in you at all. We pray that this week we will be children of the light. Help us to walk with you and may our lives reflect your light and bring glory and honour to you. Amen.